think it'll probably be 12 weeks total. Yeah. So he, um, he's a new No, it's, it's a new process now. If, uh, yeah, pretty much we think they're targeting the Good morning. Will you rise as you're able this morning and join us in singing our opening song, Open the Eyes of My Heart. It is a wonderful and beautiful thing to come here in this day into this amazing community. We give you thanks for this day that you have made. We give you thanks for this community in which you have gathered us. We give you thanks on this day, on this weekend, when we celebrate our freedom. We ask that you be with us, that you continue to inspire us, that you remind us that we are freed. We are freed not just from all of the fear and anxiety in this world. We are freed in order to be your people your people of love, your people of hope, your people of justice. Touch us once more, inspire us that we may weave together our dreams and see your bigger dream so that we may be who you need us to be. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A special welcome to worship here on this incredible, wonderful, beautiful weekend, this beautiful day that God has made. So thank you, everybody who has come out to, uh, to join in celebration. I know that we have some first-time visitors here, and so if you're a first-time visitor, please raise your hand so that our ushers can give you a little gift and a little information. Um, so thank you for coming and being here with us. 
It is always a joy to be joined in community by first-time visitors and people who are our guests. And so um, as we worship today, know that um, we're a fully inclusive community. Worship however you are comfortable. And following worship, after our closing song, we always have coffee and snacks downstairs in our fellowship hall. And um, we invite you and everybody to come on down so that we may spend a little time together and that we may be community, not just in and at worship, but after worship as well. A uh, special welcome to everybody who's joining us online today. It is a joy as we come together to worship that we are also joined by people literally around the world. We thank everybody who has been uh, watching us and joining us and worshiping with us online over the last few months and over the years, and we thank you for sharing with us your prayers. If you have a moment, we do encourage you to scroll down to the bottom of the window where you're watching this broadcast, and you'll find that there's a place where you can enter in a little bit of information about yourself, share with us your prayer requests, let us know how we can support you spiritually wherever you may be in the world and on your life journey. And for everybody who's here, thank you again. I do encourage you to rise up to let people know that they're in the right place this morning. Um, so greet those who are near you. first reading is from Genesis 28, beginning at the 10th verse. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he passed the night there. He took a rock and used it for a headrest and lay down to sleep there. During the night, he had a dream. There was a ladder standing on the ground with its top reaching up to heaven. And messengers of God were going up and down that ladder. Yahweh was there standing over him saying, I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Sarah, and the God of Rebekah and Isaac. Your descendants will be like the specks of dust on the ground. You will spread to the east and to the west, to the north and to the south. And all the tribes of the earth will bless themselves by you and your descendants. Know that I am with you. I will keep you safe wherever you go and bring you back to this land. I will not desert you before I have done all that I have promised you. rise as you are able for our second reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, beginning at the 30th verse. Jesus presented another parable to the crowds. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a farmer sowed in the field. It is the smallest of seeds, 
But when it has grown, it is the biggest shrub of all. It becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come to perch in its branches. Jesus offered them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast that a baker took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it leavened all through. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He spoke to them in parables only to fulfill what had been said through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will announce things hidden since the creation of the world. Hear what the Spirit says today. And so now I want you to go with me to somewhere on the coast of California and imagine that there's this butterfly. And that butterfly flaps its wings. And it flaps it ever so gently. And yet, it causes a bit of a chain reaction that eventually stirs up a cold front that moves into the Midwest, that ends a deadly heat wave and brings with it rains and showers to end a long drought. I believe that that is the power of our dreams. That is the power of God's dream when our dreams are connected into it. I think that that's what Jesus is trying to tell us when he shares these parables and these visions, when he tries to use words to describe the indescribable. What is it like to live in God's kingdom? What is it like when we find ourselves living in ways that our lives are participating fully in God's dream being made real. It's like he says, a little mustard seed. Think about that. Your dream is like just a little mustard seed, so small and almost insignificant. It's there, lying dormant in the field of community and in our life and in society. It's just waiting there until somehow, someday, it's touched by just a few drops of living water. And then roots go down and the stalk grows up and it becomes something much more than it ever could hope for or imagine. Our dream becomes the vehicle through which 
others find shade and shelter. Or, or imagine, he says, imagine that, that your dream, that your life connected to God's dream is like that little infinitesimal little cell of a yeast. So small, so powerless sometimes we feel. And yet the power of our dream when gathered with others, like the yeast, it gets folded and mixed in. And when living water meets breath of life, the whole loaf expands. It expands in a way that that little bit of wheat that has been ground down into flour becomes the very means through which the hungry, hungry can be fed and the world can be nourished. This is the power of dreaming dreams. It is the power of imagining that we are actually part of this unfolding story, that God's dream lives within us and through us, that the seeds of your hope, the seeds of dreams, have that kind of power to feed and transform a world. I think that that's what Jesus' ministry was all about, why he used parables, why he tells these stories. I think that that's what we find in the words of the ancient prophets. And I think that that's exactly what Jacob finds on that long and lonely journey on that night when he puts down to go to sleep and he dreams this fantastical, audacious dream. Go there with me now. And so you have to understand Jacob's story. He's there, alone. How often do we feel like we're there, alone, on our journey? We have hopes and we have dreams and we have fears, anxieties and worries and we carry them around with us. And so he's there. It is late. He's getting tired. How often are we so tired when we feel like we are lost and alone on that journey? And so he goes and he lays down and you know, it's got to be a pretty hard journey when the softest thing that you can find to put your head on is a rock. <laughs> and yet that's what he does. And he has one of those sleepless nights. Things are wrestling about, roaming around in his head. Not quite sure where he is on this journey, but he feels alone. And he has this amazing dream. He has this vision. He sees that there's this ladder or a staircase that connects heaven and earth, and that there are these messengers, these angels that are going up and down. It's like God is connected to us, with us hearing what's on our hearts, the hurts and the hopes that we have, but we too are receiving God's hopes and God's dream for the world. We are in relationship and interconnected, and there are these messengers and messengers that are going up and down, and he dreams this dream. And we're told he's frightened. Initially, he's really, really frightened. God is there, and he's scared. And I would be too, because you see, up to this point in, in, in his life, what has fully defined his journey, what has fully defined his life and his dream has been a bitter rivalry with his slightly older brother. We are told that it's a rivalry that goes all the way back to even before they were born. If you go back just a few pages in the story, what you'll actually find out is that, that when his mom was actually pregnant and carrying these twins, they were tossing about inside so much so that she actually prayed to God and said, you know, if this is what getting pregnant was like, I certainly wouldn't have asked for it. <laughs> it's like even before they were born, these two kids were like arguing and fighting with each other to see who's going to come out first. And even at the moment when they are born, his brother Esau happens to make it out first. But Jacob, we're told Jacob is like really close behind, grabbing on to the heel of his brother's foot, even at that moment of birth. This rivalry, this one-upsmanship has so completely absorbed and controlled him that it is all that he has ever dreamed or hoped or imagined. In all of his dreams, there was never room for anything other than Stealing, taking, conniving, getting what was his brother's birthright. Now, as the two boys grow up, we're told that, that dad preferred Esau. Esau was like, like 
the macho butch man's man kind of guy. He hunted and, and he went out and he killed his prey. And, and, and we're told that, that Jacob, well, mama kind of favored Jacob. Jacob was the sensitive one. He was the shepherd and he was the one who spent time and cooked in the kitchen. And mama kind of took a shining to him. And so, so life goes on in one way or another. Um, mama and, and, and Jacob actually work together and they actually succeed in tricking the father and they get the blessing that was meant for the older brother. It's like in this moment, everything that Jacob has dreamed about and has hoped for has now come to completion. He has exactly what he wanted. It's like the world is in the palm of his hand and almost instantaneously what he realizes is that it's starting to slip and fall away. Because his mother reminds him, well, now that you have what you wanted, you better get out of Dodge really fast because when your brother shows up, it ain't going to be pretty. You better run and run for your life. Researcher, author, Brene Brown, who writes The Gifts of Imperfection, she says that, that she was just absolutely amazed and she wondered for a long, long time, why was it that there were some people who when they face life circumstances, they actually are able to face them with some sort of an inner joy that they're able to persevere and get through? And why are there others, others who when circumstances and challenge kind of come by, they, they get completely swept away and distracted? Why is it that some are able to have this inner peace and joy no matter the trauma or the tragedy that they face. And there are others who even the slightest sense of mistake or setback is enough to send them into a tailspin. After interviewing lots and lots and lots of people, and she says she ended up sitting away in a hotel room somewhere for multiple weeks to go through all of the geeky stuff to try to code this and find the themes and find the patterns. She says what she discovered totally upset her, so much so that initially she put all of her research away and hid it in a drawer for a few years before she, before she was willing to take it out and face it once more. Here's what she found. Those people who are able to meet life on life's terms and have those challenges, she said there are three essential things that people have that get them through wherever they are on the journey. The first, she says that they have courage. They have the courage to meet and face life on life's terms. They're willing to accept life as being messy and difficult, the setbacks for what they are, but not willing to get defined by them. They have the courage to move beyond their setbacks and their fears. The second important essential thing that individuals have is that they have compassion. Compassion first and foremost for themselves and compassion for others. They recognize that life is messy, that we are imperfect, that we can have hopes and dreams and relationships and things just don't always go our way. Sometimes, no matter how hard we try to live upward and live that dream of hope and love, we can't help but step on our toes or somebody else's. Sometimes fear and anxiety and worry so fill us up that instead of looking upward, we're looking downward and we trip over ourselves and over our feet. And so we have compassion to allow ourselves to love ourselves and love one another with grace to forgive it, to dust ourselves up, off, and to get up and continue onward with that journey. And then the third essential ingredient that she says we all need in order to live this wholehearted life, this life of joy, which I think is what Jesus is pointing us towards and what Jacob discovers that starry, starry night when he didn't get much sleep. It's to have a deep abiding connection to that which is greater than ourselves. It is for our dreams to be so big and expansive that they live beyond us, more powerful than we could ever hope for or imagine. For our dreams to connect into God's dream, to know that you already have living within you the seeds of hope that can truly transform and change a hurting world. Only fear and worry and anxiety distract us from that kind of power that we already have living within us. 
Now, there's a story, I may have told it to a few of you before, but it's a really good story, and it reminds me of Jacob on this journey and where too often we find ourselves on this journey. And so if I've told you the story before, I beg your forgiveness. But one day, a while ago, when I was living up in Minneapolis, I was coming home from the gym, and I was walking home, and I have my gym bag, and I see that there are these little ducks, and I hear all this honking from this mama duck because she's worried because her little baby ducks can't make it up over this three-inch curbing. And one by one, they eventually try and they, they build up the strength in their legs and they're able to overcome this, except for one or two, and then eventually there's just one that's left behind who's honking and squawking and eventually falls over and gets trapped in the mud puddle. And I move over across the street and I'm about to actually go and try to give the little baby duck a nudge, but before I can do so, the little ducky writes itself up and hops the curve and then runs to race to catch up with all the others. I pick up my gym bag and I'm about to go away and I hear the mama duck honking even more fiercely and loudly than before. And I turn to see what's going on. And what I notice is that as they have moved across and behind the bushes, there's this three foot by three foot square concrete aggregate culvert, the kind of design that only city designers would do in the 1970s. And, and just harsh. And, and, and in this three foot, at the bottom of this three foot square aggregate culvert, there, there's this drain in one corner. And it's a catch basin for all of the water that then drains down into the city sewers. Well, wouldn't you know, one of the little baby ducks has fallen down into this little catch basin. And Mama Duck is racing around, honking and screaming, cannot get down in there and, and lift the little baby duck up. And the little baby duck, my goodness, couldn't make a three inch square, three inch curbing, let alone a three foot concrete aggregate well, bunker. And so, and so I put down my bag and I step in to this culvert. And as I do so, as scared and worried as that baby duck was, it was now 10 times more so. <laughs> and, and this little baby duck is like running and running and running and running, exhausting itself and exhausting all of its energy and its life force. And I'm trying to keep it out of the corner where the little, where the little drain is. And, and eventually I, I, I adapt my tactics and I start to close in and I bend down and I get a little bit closer and a little bit closer and I'm bringing my hands in ever so much to keep the little baby duck just running a little bit more narrow in terms of its path and on that lonely journey and I eventually am able to cup it just long enough to lift it up and get it out of that little cul culvert so it can go on and catch up with mommy and all of its siblings. <laughs> and as I pack my stuff up and, and I start to walk home, I think about just how powerful a metaphor that is. It is like our lives so often that are lived. It's like the, the love of this amazing God who is with you on your journey is there and present, reaching out, embracing, trying to pick you up and carry you forward on your journey. And how often does our fear and our anxiety so distract us that we try to run in the opposite way? I don't know about you, but I think that story defines a good portion of my life. <laughs> and I think that's exactly right where Jacob is at that moment when all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's not just angels going up and down connecting earth with heaven, but God, we're told in that dream, in that vision, that God is right there standing with him, standing beside him. God speaks to Jacob. God promises, I will be with you. Wherever you go, I am with you. I will be with you. We're told that this dream completely and totally transforms Jacob's life. This is what God's dream has the power to do, to transform our lives as individuals and as a community. The moment that we realize that God is with us on the journey, that the seed of hope already resides right within our hearts, when we start to share the dreams that God is giving us with the dreams that other people are receiving, the whole community, the whole life live together expands like that loaf of bread, and we find ourselves transformed into the very substance, the very thing that God has been waiting to nourish this hungry world. Brene Brown says, 
if I can catch up with my notes. Brene Brown says that whether we're overcoming adversity or surviving trauma or dealing with stress and anxiety, having the sense of purpose and meaning and perspective in our lives is what allows us to develop understanding and to move forward. To have purpose, and not just any purpose, but to know that our purpose is to be the hands and the heart of the living God, that each and every one of us have the power, the power of the mustard seed to give shelter to those who need it, the power of the yeast to transform and nourish this healing world. This is the power of dreaming and wondering and what happens when we dream and wonder together. God's dream takes work. We can't force it, we can't make it happen. I can gather up a whole bunch of mustard seeds and I can gather up as much yeast as I want and I can't yell at it and make the yeast and the loaf rise as a baker. I know, sometimes it works and sometimes that bread becomes pizza. But what we can do is we can spend our time in conversation and prayer with one another. We can open ourselves up to this God and say, here I am. We can work in order to create the conditions where we can listen more deeply to that vision that God is putting on our hearts and that vision that God is sharing with one another. We can find the courage to face the realities of this day and know that we have everything we already need in order to make life better for ourselves, for others, for our neighbors, and for strangers. We can find the compassion to have grace for ourselves when things don't go the right way, and compassion to forgive and seek forgiveness when we step on each other's toes. And we, together, together by sharing those stories and knowing that we're supporting one another wherever we are on the journey, we can find that deeper connection so that we may dream big and beautiful, fierce and fabulous, audacious dreams that are worthy of being children of this living God in whose image each and every one of us are made. This is the dream that got this community going. This is the dream that God is calling us to keep alive and may you dream audacious dreams and may we dream that dream together amen sure please rise as you're able
who's here, I do encourage you, as I do every Sunday, to take your worship bulletin. It does double as a newsletter, and there is a lot that is happening in the month of July. Almost every week um, for the next, actually, I think for the next month and a half, there is something special going on every single week. There is something for everybody. We've got dance parties and drag races, and we've got and we've got a play that we're putting on as a fundraiser, um, and we're looking for help for that. That's the end of July. We're going to be premiering some of the interviews from the stories of our history. The archives team a couple of years ago interviewed some of the longtime members and some of the people who have even since passed on, and they asked them to tell their story about this really powerful journey. And on July 22nd in the courtyard under the stars, we're going to premiere those interviews that have been edited down and I think it's going to be just this really powerful reminder of just the amazing dream that this community is and I hope that it is going to be the kinds of stories that continue to give us courage to keep this dream alive so I do encourage you to check out that newsletter there are updates from your pastoral search team there's updates from the vision team there is just a lot that is happening because this congregation is hot All right. it is I would like to point you to, um, there's a special handout we distributed a couple of weeks ago, but um, there are extra ones. As you leave the sanctuary on the podium, you'll find that there are these vision. It says discerning our motivating vision. We are in this process where we as a community are literally opening up to God's Holy Spirit and we are listening deeply. What is God calling us to be and do for the community going forward and, and, and for the world? And so. And so um, there's a little information about that. There's a place where if you get a word or a vision or draw a picture, um, we're asking you to share that. And there's a box in the back of the sanctuary. We invite you to, to put those in there. The vision team is going to be distributing those because we really want to practice this whole idea of opening up and praying to God's spirit and sharing our stories so that together we may be woven and knit together and be exactly who God needs us to be. We can't do all of that without your prayers, your perseverance, as well as um, your presence. And so we thank you for being present and showing up. We also need your support. And so uh, we ask that you give as God is blessing you. Give as you're able so that we have the resources to be this voice of hope in a way too often hopeless world. Please give as you're able. Thank you. Still to be 
still greater things to be done. Lord, we just thank you for these gifts. We thank you for the sacrifices that those in this room have made. Lord, we realize that there are greater things yet to be done, yet to come. Lord, multiply these gifts, multiply the talents in this room, multiply every seed that sits here today that we might truly be your hands and feet to this neighborhood and this world. In your name, amen. amen. Imagine. This morning, as I was getting ready for church, I was logged onto Facebook, like many of us do. <laughs> and I saw a posting from one of our sister churches in the Philippines, from Quezon City, MCC. It was about the Pink Dot celebration in Singapore this weekend. <laughs> I don't know why, but it touched me. This is a country where it's still illegal to be gay. Definitely illegal to be transgender. <laughs> there is no freedom of speech. There's no freedom of assembly. And this weekend, they celebrated what they do once a year, a celebration called Pink Dot, because they can't have LGBT pride. And over 10,000 people showed up this weekend. I, ch I challenge you when you go home to Google it, look at the video, it's on YouTube, it will give you goosebumps. Speak everybody that shows up wears pink, and speaker after speaker got up it shared how love is for everyone, regardless of color, regardless of orientation, regardless of nationality, regardless of body type, regardless of religion. 
And what really hits you is we think about the power of one is so small, that mustard seed. But at the end of their celebration, it ends at night, and everybody brings pink umbrellas or pink balloons. And they, all the lights go out and they turn on lights underneath and they light up the entire city in pink. The power of that mustard seed to grow and become a forest. The power that God gave each one of them to realize that love is unconditional. The love Christ brought for us is unconditional. You already have it. God has planted that seed in each one of us. And together we can be that forest. And we can change the world. Let's pray as we prepare for this table. God, here we are. Touch us this morning. Breathe in us. Speak to our hearts. And move us. Lord, this morning we ask for courage. We ask for that courage to continue on when we think it's rough. Because you still are in control. Lord, give us compassion. The compassion to forgive ourselves when we mess up. And the compassion to forgive others. Lord, let us see you in every set of eyes we look into. Lord, when we get so angry, when we think others have harmed us, let us be like you were that night at that table. When you looked in your disciples' eyes and all you saw were they were your children. Regardless of their mistakes, regardless of their errors, Lord, help us to have the same compassion that you have. And Lord, we pray for connection to each other. Lord, sometimes we let such petty things break us apart. We let such petty issues divide us. Lord, we let them come between our church family, between our own families, between our friends. Lord, let us see that we are one in you. And those issues are so petty that together we are a forest. We are the kingdom of God. Lord, let us see that. Let us know the strength that is available to us as we sit here today. Just thank you for giving us all that we need. In your wonderful name, amen. As Jesus sat with his disciples, those many years ago, he sat there and they were not perfect. They weren't even good friends to him sometimes. <laughs> I mean, he sat there with Judas and Christ knew Judas had gone and sold him out, that he was about to betray him. Christ knew that Thomas had doubts and wasn't even sure this was all real. <laughs> Christ knew that Peter was going to walk away and deny that he had anything to do with him. And it didn't matter. Jesus sat with those disciples that night. He picked up a piece of bread. He looked at him. He broke it. He said, this is my body. It's broken for you. This is my body, which is going to be broken for you, Amy. Then he picked up a cup cup of wine. He said, this represents my blood. This is about to be poured out for you. And it's about to be poured out for you. When you do this in the future, when you partake of this bread and this cup, remember, do this in remembrance of me. This is unconditional love. This is the love that we are called to. Lord, we thank you this morning. We just thank you for loving us just as we are. Lord, help us to know that love, to feel that love, 
and to accept that love. And help us as we come forward today, as we do this in remembrance of you, that we might show that same love, that we might be the mustard seeds, that together we might grow into a tree and into a forest, and together, through your strength and your love, we might change this world. We give you the praise in your wonderful name. Amen. I ask at this time that the ushers, acolytes, and servers would come forward as we prepare. As most of you know, here at the Founders MCC and every MCC, we celebrate an open table. For those of you who are first-time visitors who are visiting with us today, know that you are welcome today to partake. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to go through any special programs. You are welcome. God's love is welcome to all of us.
My friends, our worship may have ended, but it is time for our service to begin. As we prepare to head out into this world, especially in this time of celebration for the birth of our nation, I remind you that as we go out into the world, may you always remember that the freedom that we have is not the freedom from anything. It is the freedom for us to live and to be the people that God needs us to be. Within you resides everything you need in order to be. The hands of hope, the heart of love, the people who will bring healing in God's justice into our community, our city, and our world. Let us rise as we are able and let us sing our closing song. Yes, God. 